So, John, this is a really interesting case because you have a death of Praveen Varghese, you have a trial, and the jury convicts a person of first-degree felony murder, and then the judge overturns the jury's conviction. I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but I've never heard of that. Yeah, I knew that that was a possibility, but I had never encountered it prior to this case either. And you've been following this case since the very beginning. Yeah, I got involved in this case in 2016. I mean, long before there was anything legal going on with this case. And basically, I was just helping Lovely try to understand what was going on and and analyzing the facts of the case. So by the time that the trial took place and we got a conviction, things changed at that point. And the time between when there was a conviction and the sentencing, it just kept dragging on. And it felt really off to me. I couldn't put my finger on it, but there just something wasn't right. I'm John Taylor with the Twisted Podcast. And I'm Javier Leva with the Pretend Podcast. And this is Criminal Conduct, Season 4, Getting Away with Murder. You know, producing a true crime podcast, especially like Criminal Conduct, where it involves multiple episodes and you're unraveling this really complicated story, it's a lot like building a puzzle. You start thinking it's one thing and then it unfolds into something else. Well, guess what? Now there is this game that I've been playing with my family called Odd Pieces. It's a jigsaw puzzle. But instead of just building a pretty picture or a nice, beautiful scene, you are actually solving a mystery. So each piece you lay down reveals another clue, and you are basically the detective. I'm telling you, this took puzzles to a whole new level. And if you are looking for a cool gift idea, I'm telling you, this one is it. Go to oddpieces.com slash criminal and use the code criminal at checkout for an exclusive 15% off your entire Odd Pieces order. I'm telling you, this is not an ordinary puzzle. Ordinary puzzles are boring. Try mystery puzzles by Odd Pieces. These puzzles will blow your mind and transport you to a world of endless possibilities. It's like watching a movie and anticipating and anticipating what the cliffhanging plot twist is going to be. But instead of watching a movie, you're actually spending quality time with your friends and your family, and you get to see the mystery unravel before your very eyes. Go to oddpieces.com slash criminal and use code criminal at checkout for an exclusive 15% off your entire Odd Pieces order. That's oddpieces.com slash criminal. Use code criminal at checkout. Okay, look at that. What's that? How it's wet it is? soggy. I know. I mean, this is the same time of year that uh, Praveen died and uh, heading out here. I mean, this just doesn't seem like terrain you would want to transverse at all. Nope. And I, I doubt that it was this wet the night that he died because it was so cold. This could have all been frozen, right? Yeah. I mean, it certainly was not at this level of saturation, but this is definitely difficult terrain. And I think it's important to note that It's not as simple as pulling over on the side of the road and dumping the body like right there at the edge. I mean, if Praveen ran down, they would have had to gone down a pretty steep incline. And how deep into the woods do you think they were? Praveen was found about 400 yards into the woods, which is a long ways. You know, at first glance, it appeared that Praveen died of hypothermia, but in order to really determine the cause of death, his body was brought into a forensic pathologist. So John, let's talk about this autopsy. What was it that the pathologist was able to find? Yeah, so they had an autopsy done on Praveen Verghese, which was done by Dr. James Jacoby. He was a local uh, forensic pathologist in Southern Illinois. 
And the main takeaway from the autopsy was that the pathologist found that he died of environmental hypothermia and that there were no real bruising or injuries to Praveen's body. Yeah, it's interesting because the the report says that there's an absence of significant trauma, superficial abrasions. And, you know, the phrasing of superficial abrasion, that's just a, a medical term for minor scratches or rubbing of the skin, right? It didn't seem from reading this autopsy that there was any physical causes, right? Right. The autopsy just seemed to indicate like Praveen was in the woods, probably brushed up against a few things, and he froze to death. Though that comes back, you know, in a big way here in a bit. The autopsy report looks at a lot of things that happened to Praveen's body and just seems to say that they were natural issues. So there were superficial abrasions, but that's just like from him walking through the woods. But what about the bruising on Praveen's head? You know, the, the same bruise that Lovely found when she went to go visit the body. So that's what the pathologist attributes postmortem discoloration is what the pathologist says is the reasoning for it. But I found it interesting that he refers to it as postmortem discoloration, but he also measured it. So he measured the size of what Lovely referred to as a bruise or just a massive contusion on Praveen's head. So I just found it noteworthy that the pathologist discarded the possibility that that could have been an injury caused by, you know, someone else or something, but also took the time to measure it as if that was noteworthy. I've never seen postmortem discoloration measured in an autopsy report. Yeah, so it was significant enough for him to take note of it, but that bruise did not factor into what he determined was the cause of death, which was hypothermia, right? And hypothermia is when your body just loses heat faster than it could produce it. And it happens in very low temperatures. And as we know, Praveen wasn't dressed to be outdoors. Yeah, Praveen was wearing a short sleeve shirt and jeans, no coat on this night. And depending on what source you look at, I mean, the temperatures that night got down into the teens to maybe even single digits. So he was completely ill prepared to be outside for any period of time. And the temperature continued to drop overnight. With his body getting colder and colder, there starts to have effects on his mental thinking and his body. Yeah, as the temperature drops, so does his body temperature. And that's when the heart and your nervous system and organs begin to fail. And when you are suffering from hypothermia, you start shivering, your speech gets slurred, but it gets worse and worse because you start breathing a little bit more shallow, you get a weak pulse, you start losing your coordination, you get confused, and all of this contributes to your eventual death. Right. It's like being drunk, which is that you exhibit those same characteristics, but also the more drunk you get, the less aware you are of how drunk you are. And so the colder you get, the less you're aware of how dangerous your situation is because your brain and your thinking becomes foggy. And there's some very interesting things that I was not aware of prior to this case, which is that kind of like when you get sick, and you have a temperature, you shiver. So even though your body temperature is really high, the reaction of your body is the opposite, you shiver. And the same thing happens with hypothermia, which is if you get cold enough, your body starts getting hot flashes and you think that you're hot, which is so crazy to me because how Praveen was found is something that is apparently pretty common with hypothermia deaths, which is what they call paradoxal undressing which is that you get so hot that you start taking your clothes off. Yeah, victims of hypothermia experience some really strange behaviors, and it's almost like a last-ditch effort to survive. So you have paradoxal undressing like you described, but there have been some reports of terminal burrowing, which is basically a hide-and-die syndrome where people are found trying to bury themselves in, in small holes or in closed spaces in the final stages of hypothermia. And now that was not the case with Praveen Verghese, but it just shows you that your body kicks into survival mode. It is absolutely mind boggling to think that if you find someone in the woods in the winter and they are partially undressed or completely undressed in a hole, that that most likely means they froze to death. Like those are just crazy circumstances. Like you said, now with Praveen, he didn't do any digging. 
but he was found without a shirt on, his pants were partially pulled down. And those are some of the factors that the first pathologist in the autopsy used as kind of circumstantial uh, factors to contribute and to support his uh, conclusion of environmental hypothermia as the cause of death for Praveen. And this is why hypothermia is such a difficult cause of death to determine because when at first, could you imagine you're walking in the woods and you see somebody frozen to death, undressed, it almost looks like a crime scene. And a lot of deaths that occur from hypothermia are misrepresented as crime scenes. Could it be a sexual assault or a murder? But it turns out that in a lot of cases, it's what we just discussed, which is this paradoxical undressing. So after the first autopsy, it produced really a lot more questions than it did answers. So lovely, Praveen's mom felt like the initial autopsy missed things and she wanted a second opinion. Why did you decide to get a second autopsy? I had doubts as soon as I saw Praveen, the way the Dr. Kofer, the coroner was talking to me and all that. There was some kind of something building up in me. Are they trying to hide something? The alcohol thing, the drug thing, you know, all this started to bother me. So I said, doctor, what do you think? Should we do a second autopsy? And he said, oh, lovely, don't even think of it. No doctor is going to lie on an autopsy. So I asked Dr. Patma, I said, Dr. Patma, I saw a bruise on Praveen's forehead. What do you think? What do you think of a second autopsy? And she said, I'm not going to say anything about Dr. Kufer, but if you have any doubts, go ahead. While all of this was going on, a local radio host got interested in the case. My name is Monica Zukas, and my premise of my radio show in the beginning was just a fun little, let me talk to people in town and see what they do for a living and see what might be interesting about them. And it was neat. Monica Zukas, she became popular for covering another unsolved death investigation in the area. So when Praveen went missing, she immediately got involved. There was somebody that knew Praveen who was his counselor at church camp like every year. So when Praveen went missing, he got a hold of me. And he said, hey, there's like 200 of us coming down from Chicago to look for Praveen. He said, have you seen this flyer? And so within 24 hours, I looked at the flyer and got back with him. And for the six days Praveen was missing, my eyes and ears were that of the family's point of view. I knew as soon as I heard the press release, bullshit, bullshit, and bullshit. There were three main things that I was like, no, that's not true. The guy that got a hold of me, he did not know Lovely. Well, he knew Lovely, but Lovely didn't know him. He was like, hey... Do, have you heard about this lady named Monica Zukas? And she's like, no, and we don't really care right now. And he said, you've got to talk to her. Steph is bizarre. Don't believe everything you're being told by the authorities. Get a hold of her. Monica contacted Praveen's sister, Priya. So I called Priya, and they were actually driving home. And my urgency at the time was simply get a second autopsy, get a second opinion, don't trust what's here. And we die laughing now because I called uh, Priya. Monica called me, and I hung up. I was like, I just wasn't in the mood no. to like... And I said, who is it? And she's like, some radio host from Carbondale. I don't want to talk. But then while Praveen's visitation was going on, on a Friday night, my first live show talking about him was going on. And I got a text from somebody that went that said, he looks like he's been beat up bad. And I was like, oh, my God. I remember she played her podcast the day of Praveen's funeral. And then I think the next day, one of my friends was like, hey, take a listen. So I listened and I was like, oh my gosh, she's thinking exactly what we're all thinking. And then I showed it to my mom and then we talked. She was trying to reach out to us to do a second autopsy. But I just remember Monica telling me like, fight now, grieve later. And then our initial direct contact was we got on the phone with each other and she was hiding in her bathroom because they were saying, do not talk to media. Her attorney was saying, don't talk to media. Her husband said, talk to her. He just had a feeling like I was okay to talk to me. And we were locked on from then. Boom. The two formed a bond that remains strong to this day. We met up with lovely Praveen's family and Monica on the same spot where Praveen's body was ultimately found. But we have to go all the way in. You can't get in through calls. Yeah. Only I knew where it was. Even Monica didn't know where it was in the beginning. Every year, Praveen's family returns to Southern Illinois from Chicago to memorialize Praveen's life. Hey, lovely. How are you? Good. How are you? Okay. 
Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Good okay. to meet you. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 Yeah. But back in 2014, Lovely didn't know who to turn to. The police didn't seem very motivated. The coroner didn't suspect foul play. Monica Zukas was kind of her last hope. If you've met Monica, now the opposite is lovely. <laughs> the opposite and I was telling her, Monica. I was like, we're so opposite, but so much the same. It's yeah, just weird. We, we are kind of <laughs> the same. Like every reporter that has talked to us, you know, we, she's here, I'm there. They all are like, you guys say the same thing. You're like, you guys <laughs> literally told the exact same story. John, you've known Lovely and Monica for years, and I just was amazed because these two couldn't be any more different. Monica is loud. I be with her this morning, though. And Lovely is it's just lovely. She's so quiet. Yeah, I mean, for almost nine years now, they talk every day, and they even complete each other's sentences. I asked Priya, Praveen's sister, about Lovely and Monica's relationship. What an odd couple, yeah. your mom and Monica. Can you tell me about what that? You mean. <laughs> can, you, can you tell me a little bit about that dynamic? Interesting, yeah. It's just like, yeah, there, no, she's, Monica's been a rock for a long time. So it's, I mean, she's part of the family now. So without her, I know this wouldn't be where it is. Yeah. Monica and Lovely didn't know exactly what outcome they were hoping for. They just wanted to move the case forward and find the truth. When you guys first spoke, did you have a plan or you just wanted to talk to her? There was no plan. Make sure you find out everything you can because don't trust what these motherfuckers are saying down here. <laughs> That's a plan? <laughs> yeah. Get a second autopsy. Get a second autopsy. Get a second autopsy. Which they did right away. Immediately. When you and Lovely first got together, were you guys trying to get docu- like official documents or what was your uh, objective once you got the second autopsy? We were so twilight zone in the beginning. We were just like, what the hell's going on? Like the initial first few months were, I'm his mom, I saw injuries. I have a second autopsy, there's injuries. Why are they saying there's no injuries? What's going on? It was twilight zone. And so, cause you guys didn't have anything at that point. So it's like, you don't know what you don't know at that point either. You just know what you're being told is not right. And that was by a fluke how that worked out. The autopsy was done at the funeral home because Dr. Margolis had an appointment and then somebody canceled or something, so he did it. Praveen was late for his own visitation. In true Praveen style. Yeah. I'll come when I want. And, I mean, but that was so critical, right? To get the second autopsy? Everything. So, John, now we have two autopsies. This second autopsy is an independent autopsy commissioned by the family. It cost them about $10,000. What did they find in the second autopsy? So they hired Dr. Ben Margolis, who was a doctor up in the Chicago area, to do a second autopsy. And what's interesting is, one, this is a much more detailed autopsy report than almost any report I've ever seen. And I think that's because he wasn't just doing this as like a county coroner. He was brought in to do a detailed examination of Praveen, and that's what he did. But what was really shocking about this autopsy is that it is almost the polar opposite of what they call the official autopsy, the first autopsy. This doctor found injuries all over Praveen. And most notably, he identified what he called significant blunt force trauma to the head. And he said he thought there were at least three injuries to his head. So you have this first autopsy that just seems to dismiss any kind of injuries. And now you have this second autopsy where he is zeroing in, he is noting injuries on Praveen's legs, his arms, his head, his nose, his hands. He even identified what he believed might have been a defensive wound on his right arm, which he said at the time that it was already healing, which indicates that Praveen was alive for quite some time after sustaining that injury. So here you have, like you said, a polar opposite autopsy. You know, the first autopsy was talking about superficial abrasions, which are like little minor cuts and and scratches and postmortem discoloration. And this is finding some blunt force trauma. And really, it looks like Praveen had a lot more physical injuries than, than we were led to believe, right? Yeah. And anybody who looked at Praveen after he was dead would clearly see the huge injury on his forehead. And it's just hard to imagine how the first doctor either misattributed it or just, I don't, I can't explain how he did not identify that as a major, major injury to Praveen. 
So to me, that is the big difference in these two. So John, what was the cause of death in the second autopsy? So the second autopsy noted also environmental hypothermia. The doctor indicated that it was inferential, which is that he's basing it on the circumstances. And he also noted that he did not know the severity or impact of those injuries on Praveen's death. So he couldn't decide whether the injuries contributed or caused his death, but that he felt environmental hypothermia was the most likely cause and the manner of death was listed as undetermined. The first one said he has no injuries, that he had post-mortem discoloration, and the second autopsy said that is head trauma. It was everything. Right. He goes from no injuries to blunt force trauma on the head. 100. Yeah. I mean, it went from no injuries to 27 injuries. I mean, bruises to the bone. Every bruise he had on his body was literally to the bone. And they were saying over here first thing, he's fine. I mean, they labeled him as a female and misspelled his name over here in the first autopsy. I don't give you any credibility. So what did the toxicology report actually find? So shockingly, the toxicology report came back with Praveen having no drugs in his system and no alcohol in his system, which that was a shocking turn of events. I think that the second autopsy provided some pretty good clarity into why that was, which is the doctor noted that he felt like Praveen was alive for quite some time in those woods before he died. Because everybody who came into contact with Praveen that night described him somewhere between slightly intoxicated and highly intoxicated. Those were uh, friends, people who knew him well, his cousin, strangers, everyone. And everyone that interacted with him said something about like, well, his behavior was consistent with when he had been drinking. So I think that it is highly implausible that Praveen was not intoxicated at some level on the night prior to his death. However, he was most likely alive so long that gave time for all of the alcohol to clear out of his system. Yeah, because they actually tested the urine alcohol level on Praveen during the autopsy. And it was at 0.049%. Now, just to give you a comparison, 0.08 is considered drunk, drunk enough to get a ticket for driving intoxicated. So he did have a little bit of alcohol in his system. They attribute the alcohol that was in his system to decomposition. So that's not considered alcohol from consumption. It's considered alcohol from him going through the decomposition process. And were there any drugs found in his system? None. So I think that uh, even though I feel that there is a valid explanation for why he has no alcohol in his body and was still drinking, the family has a very strong point here, which is you have a medical data point that says there was no alcohol in Praveen's body. And you can't dispute that. I mean, that's what the toxicology reports say. So I feel like that's a pretty strong data point that really called into question kind of the overall narrative, though I feel like the narrative is of him being intoxicated at the party is still in effect. It's just this is something that's, uh, you know, out there that you kind of have to contend with as far as information that comes in. I think for me, the most disturbing part is that the fact that he didn't have any measurable amount of alcohol in his body, to me, like you said, suggests that he was out there all night probably alive, his body metabolized all that alcohol. I mean, he was probably alive for quite some time. Yeah, I think that the doctor had said many hours to even a day that Praveen could have been alive out there. So after you get the second autopsy, how did the Carbondale police, how did the medical examiner in Carbondale, how did they react to the second autopsy? Monica was hearing rumors and she called me and she said, did you hear from Carbondale about Praveen's toxicology? I said, no. I said, but I heard from here he's negative. And the authorities simply dismissed the results of the second autopsy report. The pathologist is no good. He has no credentials. He has nothing. The family paid him to do this. You know, all those stories came up. So they weren't placing any importance on the autopsy that you had done. When we come back, a prosecutor reviews the case, but things don't go the way you'd expect them to.
Praveen was last seen at a party, but how did he end up three miles away, half naked, dead in the woods? The official autopsy says that Praveen froze to death, that he died of hypothermia. But the family believes that there was foul play. So how do you resolve this conflict? Yeah, so normally at this point, a district attorney, or in Illinois, they're called a state's attorney, would review the case and kind of make an initial assessment of what's going to be done. Now, Carbondale sits in Jackson County. And at the time, the state's attorney was a man by the name of Mike Carr. So his job as state's attorney is basically to oversee the prosecution of every criminal case for the county. So it's Mike Carr's job as a state attorney or prosecutor to determine whether a crime was committed or not. And without his support, there's no case. So Monday evening, there was a vigil at SIU arranged by province friends. We were there, and there was rumors at that time that there was some kind of tip. There is a tip, there is a tip. A tip leads to a suspect in the case. Yes, sir, and this is with your permission? Yes. Um, why don't you just, uh, just tell me what brought you here tonight? Um, That's next time on Criminal Conduct. Criminal Conduct was written and produced by me, Javier Leva, with the Pretend Podcast, and John Taylor with the Twisted Podcast. Punit Shinoi with the Podcast Pundits helped us with the production and editing on this series. If you want to binge the entire series, all nine episodes, check out the link in the show notes. It will take you to the Criminal Conduct Patreon page. The episodes are also available on Pretend Plus on Apple Podcasts. Our theme music was written and produced by Ruby Rose Fox. Of course, follow us on social media. We are at CriminalCon on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All right, we'll talk next week. Creative Babble.